Thank you. Thank you uh, very much for having uh, both of us. Um, it's always nice to be able to um, come out to campuses and talk to folks about uh, the kind of work that we do in publishing. Publishing can be, uh, I think, is often a black box, and it's nice to be able to uh, uh, open, open that box and show uh, folks the contents. Um, so the way that we're going to do this, I'm going to start off and just talk a little bit about kind of publishing on more of a macro scale. And then Jessica is going to talk a bit more about um, crafting a proposal and, and a little bit more of the, the micro scale of things. So I think it's first useful for me just to say very briefly what a university press is. Um, so And what makes a university press distinct from uh, a, a different type of publisher. So uh, a university press is a, non, a non-profit um, scholarly publishing arm of a university or a college. And uh, university press is officially recognized by the university as such. So Columbia University, I'm actually an employee of Columbia University. Uh, we're a unit of the university. And university presses are connected to those, uh, to those institutions. We're not Columbia Floorwax uh, Press, or it's, it's um, you know, part of the university. Um, as a result, uh, we're governed by a publications committee of the parent organization. Our publications committee is comprised of about half a dozen uh, faculty members, and every book that we want to publish has to be approved um, by that faculty board. Um, and, it's a, and what is approved are, are peer review. So this is the other big thing that makes a university press distinct. Every book that we publish has to go through a peer review process. We usually go out and get two reports, uh, and then we ask for an author response. And uh, based upon that, we take it to our publications committee, who, who then approves projects for a contract uh, and, and ultimately for publication. And university presses tend to have a fairly diverse business model, we do books, we do journals, um, digital publications, um, anything that is uh, original resource, uh, research, but also synthetic works as well. So um, textbooks, uh, books intended for the general reader, books that can um, help to popularize um, scholarly work um, to a wider um, audience. Um, there are three basic types of university presses. There's um, what I would call the American private, of which we're part of, uh, Columbia, Harvard, University of Chicago Press are some good examples, Princeton, uh, Yale. Um, we exist at private um, universities and colleges. Um, in some cases, there's endowments. In some cases, we make money for the university. In other cases, we receive money from the university. Um, but we're a private institution. And I think the, the Ivies and Chicago um, are good examples of publishers that can I think hit the middle ground between pure scholarly work and um, and then and then the kind of trade uh, work that that Jessica is is interested in. There's also the American um, uh, or the American public university presses. So places like Texas, Kansas, Georgia, um, University of California Press, University of Georgia Press. I think I mentioned that. Um, what's nice about these publishers is that they exist. They're part of public universities, so they often will have lists that focus on those states. Um, University of North Carolina Press, for instance, has a really fantastic uh, series in Southern Foodways. Um, and this is a way in which they can make the case that they're doing not just work for the university, but they're also doing work for the, for the state as well. And then you have your global publishers, Oxford and Cambridge, of which are the are good examples. Uh, the sun never sets on an Oxford or Cambridge office, um, just like the British Empire of, of, of old. Um, and they have really massive lists. They, and what's nice about publishers of that scale is that they re, there's, there's no field that they don't do. Um, so if you do work that is you know, pretty micro and, and obscure, chances are Oxford or Cambridge is going to have a list um, that, that really fits uh, what you do. Um, all publishers have, are organized basically into three functional units. Um, I like to explain this. I'm giving a talk at my nephew's um, career day, and uh, my sister-in-law has no understanding of what I do. So I, I realize that this is useful then to kind of put this uh, slide here. So I'm the editorial director, which means that I run the editorial department. I'm also an editor, which means I have my own 
list of books. The books that I uh, edit are books in sociology and um, neurobiology and behavior. Um, the editorial department's job is to acquire, vet, and manage books through the publication process. As an author, your editor is going to be your voice, your advocate within the within the press, and they're often the public face of the, of the publisher. Uh, we're the folks who go to the American Historical Association meeting. We go out and do campus visits. Um, chances are, you know, when people recognize a publisher within their field, they know it through, through, that, through their editor. Behind the scenes is the, is the production department. Um, the production department's job is to um, Manuscript edit, design, and manufacture the books. Um, so once the author has delivered that final manuscript and it's ready to, ready to go through the publication process, um, you'll have a production editor. Your production editor is going to make sure that uh, the book gets copy edited, typeset, designed, uh, manufactured. Um, in some cases, there's a, oftentimes there's, there's a mixture of kind of freelance and in-house uh, folks to varying degrees in the, in the production department. Um, and then the next um, important unit is the marketing department. And the marketing department's job is to market, publicize, and sell the books. And these are three really distinct things. Uh, marketing means you know, making sure that you're getting your book out to the audience that you know will be interested in it. So uh, again, in the case of history, uh, you have a book by a historian. You want to make sure that you are, you know, emailing people who do American history. If the book is in American history, that you are taking it to the um, the OAH meeting, the AAH meeting. Um, you know, talking to folks that you that you know are in that field. Uh, making sure that you're sending it out for prizes uh, to the journal, the appropriate journals. Um, ads in the New York Review of Books are always nice. Things of that sort. The next um, role is the is the publicity department, and the publicity department is more of the kind of broad, kind of general broadcasting. Um, so, the the uh, publicity department is going to make sure that they're getting review copies out to uh, places like the New York Times or the New Yorker. Uh, I'm showing my New York bias here, but. Uh, um, we used to have the, uh, the, the deputy op edit ed editor for the New York Times used to live in our building. So whenever we wanted to um, have a, a book that we wanted to give to him, we would actually just give it to the doorman. Um, <laughs> it's the, one of the benefits of, of being in a, a dense place. Um, but the, so the, the job of the publicity is really just to, is to kind of broadly try to publicize books. I find that what is often really helpful is getting a few really nice media hits, and then there tends to be, um, you know, kind of a rolling effect. The media really likes to cover what the media is covering, and if you're able to kind of get something into the conversation and use your book as a, in a, as a way to instigate a conversation, you're doing well. Um, and then the sales department, the all, uh, which is, um, you know, essential. Um, most publishers, we're selling, you know, a, a good percentage of our books through places like Amazon, um, but there are still, you know, books, uh, bookstores all throughout the country. We have our own um, sales consortium, um, and our sales reps rep our books, and then a, a bunch of other university presses, including California, Harvard, Duke, NYU, um, and uh, they, we have, I think, four field sales reps who are in their cars, and they drive from place to place, and take our catalog and, and, sell, and sell books in the, in the good old-fashioned way. Um, and so those are the three um, kind of components. Um, I'll give you a sense, a little bit of a sense of what the kind of publishing client, what the business climate is at the moment. Um, and this is with a little bit more of a focus, I think, on the kind of scholarly, scholarly books. Uh, we're seeing, you know, continual decrease in library sales. Um, when I started in publishing in the mid-90s, you could usually expect, uh, you know, 800 copies of books would go to scholarly libraries. At this point, it's now about 150 copies or so. So it's really small, really small numbers. Um, there's, there's been a, a breakdown in the kind of simultaneous cloth and paperback model. Um, so, you know, that would be like the $90 cloth book and then the $25 paperback. Um, the way that that basically would work is that the libraries would buy the cloth, 
um, they would sub it would subsidize the paperback. And this model has more or less fallen apart. The uh, libraries will just buy the paperback. And then if the paperback gets destroyed or something happens, somebody spills something on it, they just buy another paperback. And they still, they could buy three more paperbacks and they're still making out well. So that's, that's something of a problem. There are fewer independents um, and fewer chains and borders is gone. Um, and Amazon is just incredibly unpredictable. Um, and so you sort of never know, um, you know what you're gonna get out of them. Uh, the media ex still expects to receive sales catalogs and bound galleys so, uh, and you know, copies of hardcover books. So we have all this wonderful ebook technology which can help reduce the costs and nobody wants it. Um, <laughs> it ebooks are, I think, are for, and this is, again, it's for the types of books we do. We were talking about this a little bit earlier before, but um, you know, if you're a publisher of romance novels, ebooks are fantastic because um, you know people will buy them, they'll consume them, and then you just you know delete it from your Kindle and buy another one. And scholarly books people like to have um, on their shelf. Um, and then the organization Ithaca, which is uh, funded by Mellon, recently did a study in which they looked at they did a study of um, 400 monographs. So these are you know, books that are gonna sell about 500 copies meant for a scholarly audience. And they looked at all four tiers of the university presses from the large university presses like ourselves to really small ones like say Northwestern University Press which publishes maybe like 20 books a year or so. Um, and they determined that on average it costs $40,000 to publish a monograph. So, uh, that means that you know if you price a book at I think it's like fifty dollars and uh, you know you sell five hundred copies you've you're you're going to break even um, so there's a real and not every the average our our average for a scholarly monograph is five hundred copies so um, you know it's 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 a cha it's a challenge at the top tier level the the large group of the university presses of which we're included. Uh, the average is $49,000. Um, part of that, I'm sure, has to do with the fact that we're all in kind of large cities and, you know, there's, there's a kind of higher cost of doing business. So, you know, th those kinds of books are very, are very expensive to, to publish. At the same time, too, pu you know, publisher, publishing is a business is generally, every, you know, is a woe is me business, but we also, it, publishing runs on enthusiasm and we're always excited about, uh, you know, what's, what's out there. Um, and so I'm going to transition then to like what, what is it that we're looking for? Um, I think first and foremost, we want an innovative take on an important uh, topic that is in, in a given field. Um, you know, it's something that is new and novel in sociology and political science and history. Uh, something, something that really is saying something that's new and interesting. Um, publish, university presses look for a balance. Uh, lists that are balanced are, I think, really significant. We want a, a good mix of junior scholars, a good mi uh, mid-career scholars, and senior scholars. If your list is all senior people, it means that you're not setting yourself up for, uh, for the future. And we want to make sure that we're you know, publishing a wide range of folks. It's the junior people that tend to win the awards. Um, you know, there's more kind of interest and excitement often ab about those, you know, those books that sell only 500 copies. But you know, if you go to the scholarly conference, you're gonna sell all of those books. And uh, you know, it may be the, the world famous person uh, is, is not the book that you're selling. Um, we look for good writing. Um, and good writing means not uh, journal writing. Um, and I think that's one trick, especially for junior people have, is like getting out of the dissertation, you know, the dissertation imposes a particular type of writing style. Journal article writing imposes a worse type of writing style. And we're asking people to kind of get, you know, put that completely aside. And, and as a result, it's often like really learning a voice and finding your voice as, a, as an author. Um, and in general, we're looking for a balance of commercial and scholarly considerations. You know, we, are, we like to say that we're, uh, we're, not, we're a not-for-profit, we're also a not-for-loss. Um, so we wanna make sure that we're you know, doing books that can help sustain themselves and pay for themselves, 
but we really want to do high quality work. And there's, you know, there could be a book that, that somebody pitches to us that we know without a doubt will sell really, really well and the author wants to publish with us, but it just doesn't, we know it's not going to pass the review process. It just doesn't have the, you know, it's not making a contribution to a field and, and that's just not going to be a, a book for us. So I'll, I'll finish off with one, um, one last item, which is just what to consider uh, when you're, as an author, looking for a proposal. And then I'll turn it over to Jessica, who's going to talk to you a bit about um, how to put together a proposal. So the first thing that you should focus on is fit. Um, so your project should fit the list of the, pu of the publisher that the publishers that you're looking for. And you should, you know, one good way to do this is to just, who exhibits at the, conf the main conference that you go to? Um, if the publisher that, that you go, and this, this is a challenge for me as, as starting a new list in sociology, we're gonna exhibit at the ASA for the first time this year. So I've had to make a case to people like, yeah, we're gonna be a great fit for you, but yeah, we don't participate in your field yet. Um, so you, know, you wanna make sure that you're looking for publishers that are integral to your field, and, and that way you know, they're gonna have the kind of level of rep reputation that you need, and you're, they're gonna be available for you to do the kind of marketing that you need. Um, you want to uh, have a good sense of what your audience is. Um, and to kind of be specific about you know, the level of readership and what fields and subfields your book is intended for. Um, and that can really vary, and I don't think that there's a, exactly a right, I think you'll disagree, but I think that there's not, there isn't a right answer to this. Um, if you're somebody who writes, you know, uh, and, and it is in a field that has expectations of, you know, uh, you know very kind of uh, jargony language and that's what happens in your field, then that's what you should do. And um, it doesn't mean that you couldn't do a, something beyond that, but, the, but that, that's not wrong for you. Um, I often advise people to think about the upper level undergraduate as the ideal um, reader, that these are students who are, have just enough background within the field to be able to kind of follow along. They've chosen to participate in this class, um, but they are still undergraduates and need a little bit of hand-holding and, and explaining. And I think that that just is a good general level, thinking about always having, as you're writing, having a, you know, an audience in your mind, whoever that might be. It may be a, a group of people, maybe just one person. You know, I want, I'm writing this for my mom so that she understands what I do. And chances are there are a lot of people in the world who have the same level of understanding of what you do that your mom uh, does. Um, so you, what's essential is the pitch. Um, and you should be able to describe the essence of your book you know, in like one or two sentences. I really think one sentence, really. Um, what, is, what is the question that your book is asking and what is the answer to that question? And to be able to just say in one sentence what that is, is really important because that's gonna carry from the point at which you're trying to make the case to an editor, an agent or an editor that um, we should take on the project to the point where the, public, the publicist is sitting in the, you know, with Bob Silver at the, at the New, York, New York Review of Books and is going through the entire catalog and has one sentence to say, this is what this book is, and Bob will say, send me a copy or pass. Um, so this is gonna kind of follow you throughout and it's important to really get that down. Um, you want to make sure that you are flexible. Um, for university press work, you're going to go, your project is going to go through the peer, a peer review process. Um, so people are going to recommend changes. Um, your publisher and your editor should recommend changes to you. Um, you'll also get recommendations from the reviewers. You'll get recommendations possibly from the um, publications committee. It doesn't mean that it's not like a journal article where you know reviewer A says this, reviewer B says this, and you need to do everything that they more or less say so that you get out of the endless R and R process. Um, you know, it's it's much more it's much more collaborative. But um, you know, the the best books are the ones where you're having a constant dialogue with the with the editor uh, and really taking the, those reviews seriously. And your editor should, I think, do a 
a sensible job of selecting your readers, and you should also try to have some input into who your readers are. I usually try to, to kind of add an element of diversity into the review process, by which I mean um, if the person is very young, go to someone who's young and someone who's senior. If there, it's a book that is going to um, cross over between sociology and political science, get a reader in political science, get a reader in sociology. And that way you can get a sense of you know, how these various different audiences and, and people in the field are going to understand and perceive the book. Um, if you're... If you have a book that is a project that is like for very specialized audiences or there is like super expensive uh, production elements, like you're writing a book on Rothko, which means that you have to have 20 Rothkos in your book. They all have to be in color and they all have to be improved by the Rothko estate. Um, that's going to cost a lot of money and we just don't have the, those kinds of funds. So if there's... If you are able to come to a publisher and say, I have, you know, I, I, I have no idea how much money that would be, but some kind of pool of money that I can use to help subsidize the expense of this process, then that will be really appreciated and helpful. And it's best to even just to, to mention that up front so that um, it could be the case that people just decline something like that out of hand because they just know yeah, we're not, we're not going to be able to produce this. Um, and finally, I think that even if you're, if, if you're working with an agent, this will happen. If you're working alone uh, without an agent, you really should talk to multiple publishers. Um, and, and even at, if you're submitting a proposal, submit a proposal to multiple publishers and, and let them know that you're submitting to, to um, you know, and by multiples I mean like, you know, two or, two or three at most, but, you know, you, you're, you're using the, the that early interaction and that early process to see, does my publisher understand this project? Do I get along with this editor? Does the editor have the same vision for this project that I do? Um, you know, as I said very early on, your editor is going to be your advocate and you wanna make sure that you're um, you know, completely comfortable uh, with that person. And there are some times where I found um, where authors will maybe have an offer from another publisher that might even be slightly better than the one that I've made, but that author just gets, you know, feels that I get the book better. Um, it happens the other way around too. Um, and, uh, you know, and I think that that's important. And at the same time too, you know, this probably isn't the only book that you're ever going to do. So um, it may not work out this time and it may, it may work out Another time, the publishing world is rather small, and um, and I think that uh, you know there's lots of opportunities for everybody to, to to work together. And I'll stop there.